live right now. Good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning, Dr. Sebic. Uh, we are uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning here on the east side of the United States, and uh, we don't know where you guys are looking for from. Uh, we are streaming this uh, live event uh, that has been uh, promoted by Peter Surgical about uh, the uh, uh, device or one of the devices available for the proximal anastomosis uh, uh, um, uh, the devices in coronary bypass grafting, named Enclose 2 device. I'm here with Dr. Joe Sabic, uh, that uh, doesn't really uh, uh, require any type of introduction. Everybody knows his uh, incredible uh, uh, efforts and incredible performance as a cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, one of uh, the leaders in, uh, in our field, and uh, currently serving as a role of chair of the Department of Surgery at University, uh, uh, University Hospital in Cleveland. I'm Gianluca Torregrossa from uh, uh, Lankenau Heart Institute in Philadelphia, and I'm extremely excited today to uh, uh, discuss about this device. It's a device that I use personally on my daily basis, every day. I love the device. I really believe in the quality and uh, in the uh, um, positive aspects uh, that uh, and the benefit that brings uh, to my own patients in my daily clinical practice. And uh, it will be a pleasure to be able to discuss. I, I believe a lot of cardiothoracic surgeons are not uh, familiar or accustomed with the concept uh, of uh, clampless uh, uh, aortic proximal anastomosis device. And uh, uh, will be a pleasure today to talk here with uh, Dr. Joe Sebic. Good morning, Dr. Sebic, and thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. So, Dr. Sebic, I, I would love to start with a, a, a brief introduction about the concept of clampless uh, uh, proximal anastomosis. So, is the concept of how do we perform our proximal anastomosis? What is out there in literature? What do we know about how we manage the proximal, uh, the, the, the ascending aorta during our coronary artery bypass grafting? What is your daily practice? Uh, how do you mitigate uh, uh, your risk of stroke in your surgery? You know, I think that's an absolutely great question. I mean, it, I think it just makes sense to all of us, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, the more we manipulate the aorta, particularly um, if it's at all atherosclerotic, you know, the greater the risk that we're going to have, our patient's going to have an embolic event such as a stroke or, or renal failure or, or other event. So it's, it really behooves us to be extremely careful. You know, first of all, and I think the most important thing is that we really have to do a very good assessment, you know, of the ascending aorta, you know, whether that's with an intraoperative TE, but we know that that has some blind spots with epi aortic echocardiography with palpation. I, you know, I think you really want to use every single sense, you know, that you have. You know, we know from the literature that if you're doing on pump surgery and um, where you cross clamp the aorta, if you do it with a single cross clamp versus a cross clamp with multiple side biter um, applications that you increase the risk of stroke. And I think that just, you know, makes sense because again, we're manipulating the aorta more, we're clamping the aorta more, we're increasing the possibility of damaging the aorta and ending up with um, embolization. You know, I think the other thing that's, you know, important when we think about proximal anastomosis, when we go to an, an off pump procedure, you know, how comfortable are you with putting that side biter on the ascending aorta? I have to admit, you know, when I began doing off pump surgery back in the 90s, it's the one thing that really frightened me about off pump surgery. You know, I, I always had confidence in my ability to do a very good distal anastomosis, to take time and work with my anesthesiologist so that I had hemodynamic stability. So I felt very comfortable when I was doing my distal. But when it came time to doing those proximal anastomoses, it was there was always a level of um, you know discomfort. You know, first of all, you got to get the blood pressure you know down before you put the side biter on in a patient who you might have done the distals but isn't completely revascularized yet and the risk of ischemia and i've seen that where we've kind of overshot the second time is while you're doing it it's very possible that blood pressure starts creeping up and the side biter starts moving off the ascending aorta and and now you're 
you're not really having a good time and you know what kind of injury or damage is that doing so i think when we look at these uh, devices such as the nclose 2 where we can do our proximal anastomosis off pump there's a level of relaxation that i have that i have just like when i'm doing my distal i'm, I'm no longer worried that the clamp is going to come off or um, the blood pressure is going to get too high or we're going to have aortic damage and so I, I like to feel comfortable when I operate. And I think that for me, uh, just as a surgeon, that's so important because it allows me to do the best job that I can do. And then I think the other thing that, you know, devices like the NCLOSE 2 allow us is, you know, sometimes you might have that patient who has an atherosclerotic aorta, but they've got a bad ventricle that's very dilated. And you don't want to, you don't want to clamp anything, but you need to do it on pump. You know, you can do peripheral cannulation such as the axillary. And if you have to do a proximal, you know, the end close device allows you to find places on the aorta that aren't atherosclerotic. So you can do that proximal in difficult situations. So I just think it's an incredibly important tool that we all have to be uh, familiar with. Completely agree. And I think that, that this is exactly the concept, uh, the first important concept that I believe people should bring home is uh, first, uh, it's get a custom, get a quietant with devices. I believe uh, as a cardiac surgical community, we lost an opportunity to show benefit of off pump in stroke, mostly because at the time in which we were running those trial, the proximal anastomosis of off pump were all done with a cross a side biter. And, and very few were starting to use these, uh, these devices. Second, even if you're not an off pump surgeon, you should be uh, facile with this device because it allows you to perform a proximal anastomosis. And it, I remember very clearly when I was a resident in Italy, no one was doing or very few were doing off pump, but everybody was doing on pump bypass surgery, but doing proximal anastomosis with after releasing the cross clamp. And that creates a situation where you are really like, cross clamp again, side clamping your aorta, and you are increasing more the risk of, 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 of stroke. You have had first your cross clamp for your cardioplegic arrest, and now you're side clamping, side batting the clamp. And it's always risky, it's always scary. The device is bulky, the, 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 the clamp is bulky. So I believe this, this device is an extremely important tool and allows us, it's also very safe to maintain without major bleeding and, and, and allow you really to control the proximal and control your risk of stroke. So I would love to discuss with you, how do you use it? Uh, I think we use it in different ways and uh, we can start by just introducing the device and this is the device. I don't know uh, if you want to, to, to uh, to tell us a little bit the story, when did you start? When did you, first time in your life you used this device? Uh, how did you did you get to, to know it? And Well, you know, I, I don't know, I can't remember whether it was back in the late 1990s, I'm showing how long I've been a surgeon, you know, or the early 2000s. I, I, I have to admit, I don't remember when it, you know, it came on the market, but, you know, as in, you know, at the time we were all so interested in in off pump surgery and really learning a lot about it. But again, you know, we were a little bit uncomfortable about, about side biters on the ascending aorta. And so I was very interested and tried really all of the devices that I could get my hands on in terms of that would allow me to do a proximal anastomosis, you know, without applying a side biter. And this was, was one of them. And in all honesty, it's, it's the one that I've stayed with uh, because extremely reliable, um, extremely easy to use. It's, it's reproducible. And as I said a little bit earlier, I, I find it helps me when I'm in a difficult situation um, that I can, you know, figure out a way. So I think it's a really important tool that every coronary surgeon, you know, really needs to be familiar with. Completely agree. So the, the, the device is pretty uh, uh, simple as a nice, slick device. Uh, it's color coded. And these one are the major elements uh, the, of the device itself. You see here in this picture two devices. Uh, and uh, one is, uh, is the device uh, open, the most distal one, uh, the farthest from us. And one is the device close. Uh, 
that is the way in which is presented when it comes out uh, from uh, the packaging. You see the difference in the lower jaw, one is closed and the other one is open, ready for the proximal anastomosis. Of course, uh, we are in a complete different setting than an operating room. This is a, uh, this is a, 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 a table. And you see here a series of switch and control. The, the color coding is very simple. The gray stay with the gray. So the switch control on the top uh, uh, is, is controlled with a screwdriver, or you can control the same action with the lower knob. The lower knob can be activated with your hands, and the lower knob and the switch control determine the opening of the lower jaw from the closed position to the open position. And the open position is the position necessary to perform the proximal anastomosis. The upper knob instead, that is the yellow one, allows you to control the height of the upper jaw. The upper jaw is separated by the lower jaw, allows you to enter from the hole into the ascending aorta, but then you can deploy the upper jaw, get in proximity with the lower jaw, with the aorta in between, creating an area where the blood does not penetrate and you can safely perform your hole to perform your proximal anastomosis. So the upper knob control the position of the upper jaw and the lower jaw. Finally, there is this extension tube that is always cool. Uh, I always have my physician assistant in love with opening and check if I creating a proper, a proper uh, uh, um, uh, area of, of bloodless area. When the jaw of the upper jaw and the lower jaw are close together and the earth is between, you can check that effectively the area you created does not, is not penetrated by any blood. And by opening the end of this extension tube, you verify that there is no blood and you can effectively create your, your, your hole and perform the uh, anastomosis. Dr. Sebik, anything else to add in terms of devices and, and usage and, and, and description? When uh... No, I think you did a, just, just a really great job. I think just to emphasize you know, with people who aren't familiar that you know, it goes in very narrow and then when you have it in the position, it gives you the opportunity then to open the diaphragm. And so that's when it gets wide. And then obviously before you take it out, you once again make uh, the insertion part uh, narrow. Um, and I think that's really kind of a really cool aspect of, of this device. It's easy to insert and easy to take out and, and very safe. Completely agree. This is our, uh, uh, some of the material that was offered actually from Peter Surgical and describe exactly the same uh, elements that we have uh, we have previously uh, uh, we have previously um, described. It's interesting to see first of all how many people are looking uh, uh, from uh, this live. Uh, it's 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 interesting to see all of the the feedback. Please. Uh, Keep us telling us where you are watching us from and uh, tell, interact with us. If you have any question, feel free to ask us what to do and, uh, and, and how, to, how can we express better uh, uh, and, and introduce you better this device. So this is the introduction of the device inside the order. We have the graphics. You have seen uh, first that there is a hole that is performed by a needle and then uh, you can insert the device. Do you like? Do, I generally tend to put the device into saline quickly before introducing it to the aura. I don't know. It's uh, uh, probably from from the percutaneous now experiences. No, I, I don't. I don't manage wire if if they're not wet somehow, and I put the device in a little bit of saline before entering into the aura. And this is exactly the mechanism. So you create this this. Uh, um, completely bloodless area where you can perform your proximal anastomosis. And by the re releasing the upper knob, you can, uh, uh, and this is the release of the upper knob, separate the two jaw and reposition back again, uh, creating uh, completely a bloodless. And the bloodless can be verified by the extension tube uh, on the back. I, I prepare a surgical video that I want to show you here. Dr. Sebi, this is the way, it's a video that I recorded in my operating room. This is me like performing first a, a regular purse string in the proximal aorta. And we are around the uh, sinotubular junction or just a little bit above. You see that there is that fat pad now that generally uh, uh, um, 
It's a usual uh, tool mark also in aortic surgery. We complete, uh, I tend to use here a 4 proline and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an RV1 needle and uh, I put a regular purse string around. I open the, uh, the fascia, I, I make sure to have exactly exposed the amentitia. And here the video will not show it, but first there is a needle to poke and then the insertion of the device. And this is the device. You see always some saline here. I always check uh, that there is good blood flow that comes uh, in order to make sure that I'm not in any dissection flat. And I don't know if, what do you do differently up to this point if there is anything that uh, has been, uh, has been uh, different than, uh, than what you do? No, I think that uh, I, I insert it exactly the way you do, you know, but, at, but as, as you know, I mean, I think if we think of the aorta um, as like a clock with, with 12 o'clock towards the arch, I, I, I tend to insert mine between 9 and, and 12 o'clock as opposed to, as I would say, this is between um, 3 and 6 o'clock, so almost 180 degrees difference. And, and the reason I, I do that is if, if the situation arises that I want to do three proximals, two left and um, one right, you know, from that one insertion point, I can hit all three uh, sites uh, very easily. You know, I just, if I'm doing the right graft, the, um, uh, the membrane diaphragm area is between six and nine o'clock. If yeah. I'm doing, let's just say a diagonal, uh, the membrane is between three and six o'clock. And if I'm doing the circ, the membrane is between 12 and three o'clock. So from that one point, I can go to all three. But I think the most important thing is to really understand the aorta, to make sure that we're inserting it in an area that is without atherosclerosis and an area where we're applying the diaphragm is without atherosclerosis. So although that's kind of the way I think about it when I insert this device, I will change my plan, you know, depending on what the aorta is like. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, it's a very important concept. This one. I, I think that uh, we should always recommend, and this is what I personally do. I always do an a, a ultrasounds of the aorta. In the, like, and this is true when I'm doing a, an on-pump cabbage before even deciding where to put the arctic cannula and definitely where to deploy, where to land the, the, the uh, uh, my proximal anastomosis. I want to know even how thick, even if there are no major calcification inside the aorta, but how thick is that wall? How thick is your aorta? What are you dealing with? And I think that taking a, a picture is always a good thing. So it takes very few minutes uh, and you can bring a, a, a sterile uh, uh, ultrasounds probe and use it to scan your aorta and plan properly where to put your devices and where to insert uh, your cannulas if you're doing an on-pump surgery. And uh, this is like the, the purse string comes down and secure the, 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 the entrance uh, of the aorta. Now, uh, I, I, for the video purposes here, I was uh, showing uh, uh, to be absolutely sure no? to, to, to be in, in the true lumen. And for such, I let a little bit of blood uh, coming back and I and now aspirate the blood out. But in, in general, is a, what I like also of this device is that it's very, it's bloodless. And you don't do any big hole in the aura before inserting any device. The hole that you do in the aura is literally a needle hole. And that's a very controlled scenario. It's a very controlled situation when you're doing a Java witness patients and you want to really control how much blood you're using in, in, in every instance, in every second. This is allow you to be completely bloodless. And now I, I generally, do, do you activate with your hands or do you activate with... Uh, uh, with uh... No, I, I use the tool, you know, just like you're doing. You know, yeah, I yeah. usually keep the, um, the little tube where the blood comes out open you know, oh. to make sure that if there's any air or anything in there, it, it, it's flushing out. And then as I'm, you know, tightening things down, because that's the one thing I think that takes a little bit of experience is how tight to bring the, you know, the um, the diaphragm or the membrane up to the underside of the aorta. And so yeah. by, like you said, watching and when the blood stops, you know, you've got a bloodless field and you don't need to go any tighter. So I think that's a really nice thing to pay attention. So I just leave it open while I'm doing that, again, to make sure any air is coming out. And at the same time, I'm not over tightening it. But I, I use the it. tool. I, 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 I don't really try to get my fingers down there. I... Yeah, yeah. 
it is the same that I do, but I will I will definitely use it to open. It's true because we, you al allow you to know exactly when you are bloodless and uh, when you. So yes. after the device goes in, the first things that I do and you should do is to interact uh, with what we call switch control. So the gray, the first gray uh, uh, and, uh, switch here, and that allow you to open the diaphragm that is uh, at the tip. And you pass from the closed position that allow you to enter and exit from the aorta to the open position with the diaphragm that is now open and ready to perform your proximal anastomosis. And, so, we, and we might want to say that there's markings, you know, on the device so you know when it's open and and, and closed. Yes. Because um, I can't, you know, which where the where the dot has to be, but you can clearly figure it out by looking at the device. Exactly. And, and like just and this is particularly important when you are removing, you don't want to remove this device with the diaphragm open. Otherwise, coming backward from that needle hole is a kind of injury for the aura. So always make sure to, to check when you are open and when you are closed. And the second element is just moving the same screwdriver into the into the yellow knob to lower the upper jaw towards the lower jaw and create that bloodless field. And that's exactly what I'm doing now. And that's what you know, Dr. Sebik was, you, you were saying like that point require, that's the, probably the only elements that require a little bit of development of proprioception. You don't, you want to make sure that uh, you, you tight enough. Yeah. I mean, I think it's better to under tighten than over tighten, but again, you, you can tell by seeing if the blood stops coming out and, yeah. and so you know that you're safe at that point. Yeah, I think the, the other, I'm sorry. Please. No, no, please, please. I was going to say, I think the important thing is, is that uh, what I, when I make my uh, air autotomy now for my proximal, I tend to use a 15 blade and, and go layer by layer, just, just importantly, so I don't pierce the diaphragm underneath. If you're using an 11 blade, you could easily, you know, do that. So just, just one of the other little tricks. And I, and I think the other thing that's really important here is not to oversize your air autotomy. I think if there's a mistake that I've made, I've, um, I've made it by, you know, making uh, my incision a little too close to the jaws and sometimes getting my uh, 6 you know, needle around that can be a little bit difficult if it's too close. I mean, it's easy to fix. Obviously, you just take the device out when you're done and you can yeah. put a, a single interrupted stitch there and it takes care of it. But it's, it's just one of those things that you learn with, you know, experience, I think, to maybe make things a little bit smaller than you might do if you were doing it let's just say you were doing it on pump with a single cross clamp but to maybe uh, uh, don't oversize your air autotomy do your best to make your punch you know directly in the middle um yeah. and it gives you a little bit more freedom when you're sewing completely agree so again so at this point uh, it's like i generally remove the the, the little adventitia around uh, like the, this is now the area where we are going to land i remove the adventitia arrive uh, really like uh, uh, on the, I, I remove the periadventitia what is the fat and the stuff the fascia around arrive in the adventitia and i agree i use the same spatula uh, 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 knife that i use for distals uh, uh, in distal i have two type of, of blades one is the one that i really poke through that is a super sharp diamond and then i have a very square type of blade that in distal allows me to arrive to the adventitia of my distals removing all of the fat around it and i use the same spatulated blade that resemble exactly 15 to enter basically layer by layer as you were saying you don't want to poke the device because underneath you have a membrane and the last things that you want to do is to create a hole in that membrane and now you have blood that will come backwards toward you so slowly opening layer by layer until when you feel that you have perforated the all of the layers of your aorta and now you have this leak uh, of, uh, opening and at that point uh, we, we insert a, a punch the punch is flat at the end so it's not the the, the usual punch that we use uh, in, in in proximal anastomosis that generally has a little uh, rounded uh, uh, elements uh, at the end of the metal hand and this is the punch insertion, you come in and you come out. There are two sizes you can choose between a small and a large uh, uh, device, uh, creating different type of hole. Generally, as, as Dr. Sebik was saying, uh, 
uh, uh, smaller is is uh, is a like is a good uh, is a good size to 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 allow you to stay in the center to stay in the middle and then you basically construct the proximal anastomosis in the usual way in which you will construct the proximal anastomosis trying though to put all of your stitches within that uh, uh, metal uh, 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 elements of the upper jaw that define a little bit the end no, of your anastomosis do you uh, 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 do you flash uh, this device at the end? Do you do anything or? Yeah, no, I, I do pay attention to air. And just before I'm going to tie my suture down, I will uh, relax the jaws a little bit so I get some blood that comes back. Now, if I've done, like, I believe this is a radiograph that you're showing us. Yes. I mean, that, that's going to bleed back. And so I'll often, if I have a bulldog or some type of clamp on the radial, I will open that. I will relax the jaws a little bit so I get a little bleeding back so I feel comfortable that I don't have any air remaining in there and then I will tie down my suture. I, I, I tie it down with, with, there's not a lot of pressure in this space. Yeah, completely agree. I never, I, I want to avoid that purse string effect. They're like tying down after you just pass the stitches and potentially purse string your proximal anastomosis. Instead, you want some blood passing through it uh, and make sure that uh, your 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 uh, uh, your anastomosis is plumped up and uh, ready to be to, to to be a nice proximal site, and then uh, I I close the the the, uh, the device. I reopen and close quickly the device. This is just opening a little bit. You see, with uh, with the elements, with the uh, um, with the screwdriver. And as you were saying, this is a radial, so I, I you will see that I remove uh, that uh, uh, um, bulldog, and I use this small green bulldog, I love them, to let it bleed back in order that I can uh, make complete sure that my anastomosis is plump, is not, is not flat, is not pancaking, that's what I call it. It's not a pancake, it's a, it's a nice open, and it's a nice... Uh, yeah, but you have uh, a nice hood. Hood, exactly. I completely, completely agree. And that's it. And then I just make sure that my diaphragm is back in close position before removing the device. Mm -hmm. The other advantage of the device, I think it's uh, the opportunity to um, perform multiple proximal anastomosis uh, with the same device. That has always, the, in the elements of cost, uh, has always a benefit. No, no I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, especially under the pressure that we are all under today to reduce our costs as much considering, you know, the inflationary pressures that have helped that have hit healthcare supplies and, and, and labor in, in all honesty. And I agree. I think that is a huge positive of this device. And, and I think that gets back to a little bit about thinking about, well, where do you want to insert it such that it gives you the, the best utility for what you need to do for that, that patient and also do it in a very safe way. Yeah. Completely agree. I think that the planning is important and you can mark also, you can see how far from the entrance your end position will be. So you can mark exactly where you want your proximal and you can decide where to put your purse string to basically use the orientation of the device uh, in different position. And uh, you can even, and this is one of the things I, I love to do is uh, what I call a piggyback, you know? so putting the vein on the order and then after I complete this anastomosis, I open the hood of that vein and land with a radial artery or another vein on top of that uh, single, uh, single, uh, single, uh, single hole. And this is just to minimize uh, the amount of aortic manipulation that I think is always important, particularly in patients uh, where the aorta is not healthy, is not, uh, is not uh, the best aorta that uh, you have been with. Yeah, that, that was a technique that, um... You know, we all learned and we used to do a lot of reoperative coronary surgery where patients had previously a lot of vein grafts on their ascending aorta. And one of the interesting things is even if that vein graft was occluded, often the proximal hood was still open. And so in a situation where you just didn't have any aorta left uh, to do proximal anastomosis by often opening the hood of the old vein graft, you had a very nice place to do it. But and I, I completely agree with you. And I really like that technique when I'm doing free arterial grafts and I don't feel comfortable putting the arterial graft directly on the aorta, particularly if it's a small 
arteriograph, maybe something that has a, a two, two and a half to three millimeter, you know, diameter. But if you're doing a free rema or a small radial, um, I think putting that on the hood of another graft, such as a vein graft, is a, is a very nice tool to have. And the other thing is it's, it's very safe because sometimes, as you know, if you're putting a, let's say, a, a rema on the aorta and you have bleeding problems, that's a difficult, can be a difficult thing to repair. But if you have bleeding problems and you put it on the hood of a vein graft, that's just a very simple 7-0 stitch. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very good technique to know. Yeah, 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 I think that this is exactly the reason why I do it. Some particularly female radial or or as you were saying, Rita, like you, you, you the risk of uh, flat that anastomosis is high, and uh, I believe that it's uh, a very important uh, to land or at least landing on a top of a vein makes way simple the type of anastomosis, uh, and you use a seven O, and uh, that allows you to to create a perfect. Uh, nice uh, double layer or double deck anastomosis with the vein down there and the uh, uh, second arterial on top of it. And that the arterial can come from each direction. The vein can come from the right and the arterial come from the left and you create this uh, V or mustache type of, of graft uh, with a single hole that goes into different direction. Right, and it's, it's so simple to use with this device because you yeah. just need the device in place. And uh, Correct. it's very bloodless. And, and, and it's completely bloodless, and so you al allow you to basically do only one manipulation. You do your vein, you just uh, untie it enough uh, to plump before you, 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 uh, uh, you, you tie the, the anastomosis down. Then you recreate the ceiling, you open the hood, and you do your arterial conduit on top of it. And that's what I generally, is my generally practice, uh, like uh, try to do only one hole in the aura and multiple anastomosis out of it. Yeah, and, and the one thing I would like to emphasize again is the amount of comfort and relaxation I have when I'm using this versus a side biter. Because if I'm yeah. doing these multiple graphs on, on top of the hood and that side biter is slipping back towards me, I'm feeling very uncomfortable, I'm feeling rushed. But with this device, I don't have to worry about that. I, I have here some of, of the material of the debriment that you can have by using a proximal clamp. And you know, I, I believe we even when we don't have a clinical significant stroke in our patients but you know like yes your patients doesn't is not highlighted in your excel uh, 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 file of your outcomes of surgery as stroke there was no stroke code there was nothing on him but then when they go home you know they're not as sharp as they were in playing sudoku you know what i mean like the he, he, when you have this small debris and go that go around, I believe you are doing a disservice. And instead, look on the side of the enclosed tube. Your aorta is is touch. This is like a complete less invasive, uh, 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 a way more respecting type of 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 the of, uh, of proximal anastomosis completion. And I think it's so important uh, for the risk uh, of. Uh, mental impairment uh, or uh, sharpness after surgery, neurodecognitive decadiment, minimizing your arctic manipulation is in the interest of you as a surgeon because it's in the interest of your own patients. And I think planning properly with your ultrasounds before you are doing anything and using a device uh, like the Enclosed 2 are essential elements uh, to, to make sure that uh, you don't send debriments or, 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 or air within, uh, within your, uh, uh, your vascular system. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, in all reality, I think the difference between having good results and great results as, as a heart surgeon is really comes down to paying attention to every single detail, right? Everything we do, understanding the, the, the negative that could happen and then doing things so we only have the positive things happen. And it's that attention to detail that makes a difference and doing the best we can do all the time to prevent the possible from happening that has a negative consequence. And we don't know in all honesty when that's going to happen, right? But, it, but if we adopt techniques that are the safest techniques that we have and we pay attention to the A order, we respect the A order, then we're going to have great outcomes. And I, and I personally believe that's the difference. 
completely agree. I think that this is like an extreme, and this is where the excellence of surgery comes from. If you look though, like, and I think uh, no one better than you can discuss this topic. Like, I, I strongly believe that since uh, even syntax, since uh, the early 2000, our outcomes in surgery and cab surgery has improved significantly. Our rate of stroke in syntax uh, in, in a trial where we have a lot of cherry picking and uh, extra care to make sure that you're doing great was outrageously high, was in the 5%, in the 4 or 5%. Today I we the answer to, yeah. to your question, and, and and I know you know Excel study has some pluses and minuses, but we all know that left main disease is a huge predictor of stroke in patients undergoing coronary surgery. Yeah, but we know from Excel that when we do exactly what you're talking about, you know the improvement we've made from syntax, there was no difference in stroke between PCI and cabbage in Excel. That to me was is something I did not expect. That just tells us how far as surgeons we have come in mitigating risk um, by paying attention to details and adopting you know, these techniques. I don't think anyone would believe that in left main disease, we could have equivalent stroke rates to PCI, but we do now. That's do. amazing to me. Completely agree. Like doing a major coronary surgery is the same. And most, I think most of, in the Excel, most of the cab surgeon were done on pump uh, they were not off pump, but we're done on pump. So it, it, it tells you really that we have advanced the field of coronary surgery. If we believe that coronary surgery has been steady state for the last 20 years, we are not acknowledging how much attention to the details, to the quality, and to what we do on an everyday basis. And, and I think this is huge. This is important. And frame-free trial has shown the same. Frame-free trial in the design of frame-free trial and I was speaking with uh, Dr. Firon, the first author, about it. If the results of CABG were the same of syntax, fame-free trial would have shown that PCI FFR guided is better than coronary bypass grafting. But they did not expect it that CAB just advanced, advanced so much that the outcomes are so much better than what it was 20 years ago. And I think that these devices, these attention to details, this planning, the use of a respect for the ascending aura are strategical elements that are extremely important in mitigate any type of risk from myocardial infarction to stroke in patients during coronary surgery. Completely agree. I, no, I think the uh, results of coronary surgery are absolutely fabulous today. So we are on the wrapping up time. I think uh, 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 the, the elements uh, that we want really to discuss uh, and the value about uh, this device, I think it's, it's try to get familiar with it, try to get to know who is your local rep, try to get to know who is the distributor of this uh, Peter surgical enclosed to device in your area and try to get used to and you can use it in on-pump surgery when uh, you are doing your proximal or, or not on the same uh, cross clamp. You are doing a lung surgery. You are doing maybe a combined uh, cab valve surgery. You want to decrease the amount of cross clamp. You want to do your proximal while your heart is beating. Do not side clamp the aura. I would say that side clamping the aura it's risky, it's not healthy for the patients, it's not healthy for that aorta, and it's just like you put yourself in, a, in an uncomfortable situation and you give an increased risk of stroke more than anything else to patients. And this is an incredible, valuable device. Your original, and as we have seen and as we have shown in the video, when it's a very uh, uh, easy uh, insertion of the device, after the completion of a purse string, you insert the device and the device is just entering from literally a needle hole in the order. So everything is nicely controlled. The hole that I'm holding be underneath my finger is extremely tiny, it's not a huge hole. You don't have to insert big devices into an aorta that is, uh, 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 is, um, is open by a 4.5 basically uh, millimeter open. It's just a small needle. You insert, you close your, your, your purse string, and you are ready to deploy 
your device to create uh, the bloodless area. Two knobs to, to, to rotate and very easy. Uh, the gray, stay with the gray and open the diaphragm and then the yellow decrease the jaw and create the bloodless. And I really like Dr. Sebik, what you were saying next time I will, from today, today I have a case in, in a couple of hours from now, I will keep the end open. So I will uh, make sure that I don't have any debris. And then I think, you know, it's always probably worth, you know, mentioning, you know, doing something different at, at, at first is always maybe, in, you know, builds a little bit of anxiety in the first time or the first few times that you use something, it may not go completely as planned. And I think that that's really important for us to understand as surgeons. Number one, you know, we want to be safe. That's the most important thing and that we have, have great quality. And I, and I, I personally believe this device can, you know, helps us on, on doing that in, in many, many patients. But, you know, I think that all of us who, who like doing new things know that the first time that we do something, you know, it's a little bit different and it, and it takes a few times to get comfortable. And so I think one advice we might, people might want to consider is, is using the device in a situation at first where you might not need to do it. So you can be comfortable with it when you need to do it. So maybe you're doing an, an on-pump uh, cabbage and you need to do a proximal. You might want to try the device in that situation just so you become familiar with it in a situation where you are already comfortable and very familiar. Just as a way of you know, thinking about how do we teach ourselves so first of all, we do no harm. We're yeah. always safe. But then when we need to use it, we're comfortable with it. And um, that uneasiness that we have or that feeling when we're doing something for the first time isn't there when we need to do it. Just something to think about. Excellent, excellent suggestion. I think uh, to advance the field, you, you and uh, to keep pushing forward to get familiarized with new devices, with new elements, with new technique, that's exactly the way in which you, uh, we should proceed. And this is uh, such a master tips. Uh, create your comfort zone and in your comfort zone, try to make some little modification in order that when uh, you are dealing with the most challenging patients, uh, you are familiar with those devices or those elements that really can make a huge difference for that specific patients. And, uh, and again, I think that I'm putting also more quality, more attention to the proximal anastomosis is another key element of the coronary surgeon of 2023. Here is where we play the risk of stroke for our patients in off pump, but even in on pump surgery, I think that too much touching of the ascending aorta it's not, uh, it's, not a, 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 it's not a good strategy. I, I, I always have like this story of one of my older surgeon and uh, um, in, uh, in, uh, and when I was uh, at uh, uh, Mount Sinai that used to tell me that back in the days he opened these patients, it was pre CT scan era. And there was this completely hostile ascending aorta very difficult. He didn't know what to do. I think he was there for an aortic valve replacement, was way before Tavi. He, he, he didn't felt that he could cannulate or cross clamp. He called his boss and his boss comes, scrub, and they touch the aura, they check, and he agrees. And then he's not so sure. So he called another experienced surgeon and the other surgeon come in and they check the aura. And basically they said nothing to do. They close the chest, they go upstairs in the ICU, the patients get extubated and the patient had a stroke. And most likely just because they touched the aura. They didn't cannulate the patients, they didn't cross clamp, they didn't do the aortic valve replacement, but unfortunately the patient stroke. And I think that touching too much and being too invasive and checking is not the right thing. So take your ultrasounds probe, plan your strategy, see where you want to put your cannula, see where you want to put your cross clamp. And if you're using one of these devices, I think is excellent. This enclosed tube can allow you to enter properly, deploy your proximal and uh, deploy multiple proximal if you want and decide exactly where to be and where to, to stay. Dr. Sebik, I leave you the, the, the final word and uh, I invite everybody to visit Peter Surgical uh, in, uh, in, uh, at EX uh, at the booth uh, 20. So there will be definitely in close two days to, to get fami familiarized and you can play with them and you can see them in a, in a, in a different setting than the operating room. And uh, so you can get accustomed. But please, I let you close this event and uh, with your final reward, your, your final words.
Well, 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 first of all, thank you. You know, thank you for the opportunity to participate today. It's always a pleasure to, to, to talk about heart surgery. I know we all love heart surgery, and I think that we all love making it better and, and doing what we can for our patients. And so I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. No, thank you so much for participating today. I'm, I'm sure you're extremely busy schedule. So thank you for taking this time and to educate all of us about uh, this device and uh, help us to get better. And uh, looking forward to see you at the booth of Peter Surgical. And please feel free to get in touch with us if you have any type of uh, question. The device, there were some questions that came up. The device is approved in Europe as well. Yes, has a market in East Asia, in the United States uh, and South America. So. I'm very confident you can find or you can touch directly, get in touch directly with Peter Surgical to understand who is the distributor of your area. Thanks again. And uh, Dr. Sebic, uh, have a great day. I know it's uh, almost eight o'clock. So thank you again for, for your time here. And uh, looking forward to see you at PX. See you soon. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye.